Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading to you from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 24 When neither Matherson nor Violet appeared at breakfast that morning, Pansy hastily finished her pretense of a meal and went up to the nursery. Buster was dressed and playing with some trains on the floor, and Joyce was tidying the room. She was pale, and her eyes were swollen with crying. Pansy caught her breath. Oh, Joyce, what is it? Mr. Matherson says I must go, today. He told me last night I was not wanted anymore. Joyce! Pansy caught her by both arms, turning her round. She stared at her with incredulous eyes. Didn't, didn't you know then? Joyce asked in a quivering voice. He threatened to do it last night, but he said things like that so often before. I didn't believe him. Pansy answered. Her hands fell to her sides. He, he didn't mean it. He was angry. That's all, she said uncertainly. I think he means it all right, Joyce answered bluntly. I've packed my boxes anyway. Pansy gave a cry of bitter indignation, but I refuse to let you go. Pansy stood staring into the garden with burning eyes. It's monstrous, she said again. I will not allow you to go. I will find Basil and tell him so at once. But Matherson was nowhere to be found, though she met Violet in the hall. Have you seen Basil? Pansy asked. Violet laughed and shrugged her shoulders. <laughs> no, and I don't want to. We had the dickens of a row last night, and I have got my marching orders. What do you mean? Only what I say, my dear. St. Basil got up on his high horse when I ventured to give him a little sisterly advice, and we had a fine old row. He ordered me out of the house with expletives, and I'm going this morning. Pansy wrung her hands. He must be mad, she said piteously. He's told Joyce to go, too. He must be mad. He's a brute. I know that, Violet said. Then she put her arm round Pansy. I don't care a hang for myself, but to have to leave you here with him. Pansy seemed not to hear I must find him. I must find him, she said feverishly. She went out into the garden with Violet following. He's gone out, I think, Violet volunteered. I heard the car quite early, anyway. Hello! Here's Buster. She turned round to wait for Buster, who had called from the front door, and Pansy went down to the garage. Gates was there, swilling down the... Gates was there, swilling down the yard. Has the car gone out? Pansy asked. Yes, ma'am. The master went out early. About seven, I should think. Oh, she turned away, then back to ask, Do you know which way he went? Did he say where he was going? No, ma'am. There was despair in Pansy's heart as she went back into the house, supposing he had gone over to Lynn at Chitswell's, supposing he told him what had occurred last night and of his own suspicion. I will not go on living if he has. The thought, the thought wildly. The shame and humiliation would kill her. What would Lynn think? She went back to Joyce. I will not let you go. I will not allow it, she said again feverishly. Down in the garden, she could hear a buster's laugh, and, looking out, she saw him chasing Violet across the lawn. If only she could take him and go away. If only she need never come back, never see her husband again. Presently, Violet came to her. I suppose it won't matter if I go to the... St I suppose it won't matter if I go to the station in the car, will it? She asked, or shall I phone for the local chariot? She spoke lightly and defiantly, but her heart was almost breaking. First, there had been the shock of finding that Lynn still loved Pansy, and now, to be turned out of the house like this was more than she could bear. You're not going. I won't allow you to go, Pansy said in a harsh voice. Or if you do, if Basil insists, I shall come with you. Violet laughed shakily. <laughs> I wouldn't stay if Basil went on his knees and asked me to. She said, I think he must be mad, Pansy said again. She went once more to the window. Where's Buster? Oh, he's all right. I'm going back to him in a minute, Violet answered. We've been playing horses. Pansy, he's quite himself again, isn't he? Yes, bless him. Pansy's voice quivered. Violet went away, and Pansy followed Joyce to her room, where her trunk stood ready packed. Pansy sat down on the side of the bed. She was trembling very much, and her own agitation frightened her. If you and Violet go, there will be nobody left who cares what becomes of me. She broke out wildly. Joyce took her hand. I shall always love you. And there's Buster. I know. I love Buster. 
But he, he's so young. You don't know what it is, Joyce, to have nobody of my own age and nobody to care. I wonder, however, I, I wonder, however I've stood it so long, and yet I know it's my own fault. It serves me right for marrying without love. It was the first time she admitted her unhappy marriage. If you and Violet go, if you and Violet go, I won't stay in the house an hour, Pansy went on, in the same high, excited voice. If he makes you two go, I'll, I'll go, too, I, she broke off with a jerk, turning her head to the window. What was that? she asked sharply. Joyce let go of her hand. I, I thought I heard someone scream, she said uncertainly. She went to the window. I can't see anyone, I, then she stopped, as Violet came suddenly into view, running wildly, her arms outstretched, her mouth wide open, as if her whole life and energy had gone from her in that one terrible scream. Joyce turned hurriedly to the door. Something, something must be the matter. Let me go. I, Pansy started up. I'll come with you. They ran down the stairs together and met Violet at the open doorway. When she saw Pansy, she swayed forward and fell at her feet, clasping her skirts with frantic hands. Don't go, don't go, she wailed. She could hardly speak. Don't let her go, Joyce. Pansy stood petrified. Then she stooped and tore herself free of her sister's frantic grasp and fled out into the garden. Gates was running down the drive towards the gate, and she was and she followed. She had overtaken and she had overtaken and passed him before she saw the two cars at the gate and the little group around them. And Lynn, his tall figure seemed to stand out from amongst from among them. His tall figure seemed to stand out from among them all, and his face was ghastly white. He saw her and moved forward, as if to hide something from her, but she pushed him aside with almost superhuman strength. What is it? <gasps> she screamed once like a madwoman and fell on her knees beside the little do beside the little figure lying there. Buster, darling, my own darling, look at Dodie, speak to Dodie, whatever they've done to you, my beautiful, my beautiful. Her voice had fallen to a soft groaning, as if he were asleep and she feared to waken him. She gathered him into her arms, and his pretty head, with its cropped hair, fell back limply against, his against her shoulder. She looked down at his marble face, with its ugly bruise, and a frozen horror seemed to settle into her eyes. Matherson was sobbing, great heavy sobs that seemed to rend him. He bent over his wife. Pansy, my poor girl! She knelt there, staring up at him with a buster clasped to her breast. For the moment, it seemed as if she had lost her reason. She offered no resistance. When someone took the child gently from her, she rose stiffly to her feet. She looked like a frozen statue, save for her eyes, which were burning as they searched first one face, then another. Matherson, people from the village who had come running, Gates, with the tears running down his weather-beaten cheeks, everyone, till they came at last to Lynn. She spoke then in a terrible voice that sounded as if it had struggled up from the depths of hell. Who did it? Matherson broke into labored speech. He ran out. Nobody saw. It was too late. The car. He could not go on. This was the end of his life with Pansy, he knew. And in that wild, tragic moment, for his everlasting punishment, he knew that he still loved her with every beat of his heart. Pansy glanced. Pansy glanced apathetically at the two cars before she turned again to Lynn Ramsden. Who did it? She asked once more. Her eyes were a prayer to him to tell her, and through all his anguish he was conscious of a little thrill of comfort in the knowledge that she had appealed to him and would believe him. Then he looked at Matherson, and across the tragic figure of the woman they both loved, he saw his tortured face and the agony of his eyes that flashed a wordless appeal. It was an appeal for forgiveness, for one more chance, for pity, the appeal of a coward to a strong man, perhaps, and yet the only one he knew how to make. And Pansy asked for the third time in the same terrible voice, Who did it? Lynn took a step forward. I did. I was driving the car. Gates broke into loud sobbing and turned away. All along he had dreaded that his master had been responsible, and though he had no particular liking for Matherson, it gave him unutterable relief to know that he had not killed his own son. Matherson's heavy figure swayed for a moment before. With a mighty effort, he controlled himself and put out shaking hands to his wife. Pansy! Pansy! She did not hear. Her eyes were still fixed on Lynn, but now their stony grief had changed to a very madness of hatred, and her lips were drawn back in a terrible, distraught smile. She took a step, for, step towards him, her clenched hands raised above her head, as if calling upon God to curse the man who had robbed her of everything that had made life worth living. Oh, I'll never forgive you to my dying day. Never, never! 
Her shuddering voice seemed to tear the warm sunshine of the morning. All the sorrow I have ever known has come through you. Then she crumpled up and fell at his feet in the dusty roadway. Kindly people closed around her and carried her away. A doctor, who had been hurriedly fetched, rose from his knees beside Buster and shook his head sorrowfully. There followed a terrible silence. Lynn stood bareheaded in the sunshine, staring at Matherson with dazed eyes. There seemed nothing to be done, nothing to say. Buster was dead, and he had taken the blame to save the man he hated. People were staring at him curiously and whispering together, but he was unconscious of it. Presently, he turned and began to walk away. For the moment, shock and his real grief at Buster's death numbed his heart and brain. He only felt that he must go on walking till he dropped. He went back to Chiswell's. There was the inevitable inquest to face, he knew, and some sort of story to be agreed with Matherson. Mrs. Gee came to him pale-faced and agitated. Is it true, sir, about Mr. Matherson's little boy? They say... Quite true, Lynn answered shortly. She gave a cry. Oh, the pretty dear! How did it happen, sir? Lynn told his lie boldly. He ran out from the roadside and I knocked him down. She broke into tears. Oh, his poor mother! Lynn's heart contracted. Yes, his poor mother, his poor mother indeed. Pansy's words echoed through his heart with cruel meaning. Oh, the sorrow I have ever known has come through you. His best beloved had said that to him when he could have died to save her a tear. Why had he done the quixotic thing and taken Matherson's blame upon his shoulders? Matherson was nothing to him. No, oh, but Pansy was. Lynn felt hopelessly that in some way he had saved her pain by sparing her the knowledge that Buster had died by his father's hand. Of himself she already believed the worst, so how could anything else matter? The morning passed, but nobody came near him. He made a pretense of eating lunch to satisfy Mrs. Gee, but she half-maddened him, as she came in and out of the room, by her voluble, well-bent chatter. Accidents would happen, she declared, and everyone knew how foolish children were running out into a road without looking where they were going. An only child, too. She had always said what a mistake only children were. If anything happened, the loss was terrible indeed. Such a pretty little dear he was, and the image of his mother. Did Mr. Ramsden remember the day he came to tea with Miss Tremaine and Miss Lindsay and played with Tom Tinker? Did Mr. Ramsden remember how? Lynn got up abruptly and strode out of the room. The numbing shock of the tragedy had passed now, and every word Mrs. Gee spoke stabbed him like a knife. An only child, and all Pansy had in the world. What would she do if only he had the right to go to her, to comfort her? The house seemed stifling. He went out into the garden and met Violet coming up the drive towards him. She was riding Joyce Lindsay's bicycle, and when she saw Lynn, she tumbled off ungracefully, letting it fall. Her face was flushed and swollen with crying, but her eyes were pathetically tender as she looked at him. I was afraid you might be out, she faltered. No, nobody sent me, she added, and answered to his unspoken question. But there's going to be an inquest, of course, tomorrow, I think, and I wanted to see you first. Lynn answered constrainedly. It's kind of you, but you shouldn't have bothered, he looked away. Matherson might have might have come himself, he added, with a touch of anger. Yes, that's what I think, Violet agreed, in a hard voice. But perhaps he thought he ought to stay with Pansy. Perhaps he thought it would look better, she added cynically. There was a little silence. And your sister? Ramsden asked with an effort. Oh, poor darling. Violet's tears came again. It's dreadful to see her. She doesn't shed a tear. She hasn't ever since she came out of that faint. She just sits with one of Buster's toys in her hand, not saying a word, staring before her as if she was looking miles away into space. Lynn caught his breath hard, and Violet went on. We've tried all we can to make her cry. The doctor says she must or she'll go out of her mind. Basil isn't any good, of course. He only fusses. Oh, I think some men are the limit, Violet added with a sob. Lynn could not speak. He picked the bicycle up and mechanically straightened the handlebars that had been knocked crooked in the fall. Now there's this dreadful inquiry, Violet went on. Why we need to have it at all, I don't know. We might have got out of, out of it. Only Basil insisted. Insisted? Lynn's voice was incredulous. You mean that Matherson insisted? Violet nodded. Yes, he did. He said he was going to have the whole thing cleared up. She was not looking at him, but her lips were trembling. Lynn laughed harshly. <laughs> <laughs> Matherson insisted, he said again, as if he could not believe it. Yes, and so, what are you going to do about it, Lynn? Do? He passed a hand across his eyes agitatedly. What can I do? What, can, what do you mean? I mean, what will you say when they ask you questions? How it happened and all the rest of it? I shall say what I said before, I suppose, Lynn said hoarsely that I was driving too fast, and he, Buster, ran out into the road, and I couldn't pull up. What more can I say? 
And then, Violet asked shakily, Can they do anything to you for that? He shrugged his shoulders. They might bring it in as man they might bring it in as a manslaughter, but it's unlikely, his voice broke suddenly. My god, it's too horrible. Too horrible, he said in agitation. I know. Violet looked at him and swiftly away. That's how it seems to Pansy. If only Lynn if only it hadn't been you who did it, I don't believe it would have seemed quite so terrible to her. He turned his head away. I don't understand. Violet choked down a sob. <laughs> I think you do, she whispered. There was a terrible silence. Then Violet broke out passionately. Oh, I think it's time someone was honest and straightforward and not afraid to tell the truth. We seem to have been living so long in lies and deceit. What's the good of it, Lynn? What's the good of it? I don't understand, Lynn said again. Then it's time you were made to understand, Violet answered. She took the bicycle from him and pushed it away against the hedge. She looked up at him with brave eyes. I know it seems horrible to talk of things like this just now when darling Buster. Her voice failed her, but she struggled on again. But it's got to be done, Lynn. What's the good of everyone being miserable for the rest of their lives when it's not really necessary? Lynn, you know, you must know that Pansy loves you. Violet, for God's sake, it's true. You must and you must know it, she went on desperately. I wonder I never saw it right from the first, because I didn't want to, I suppose. But lately, I seem to understand a great many things I never understood before. I understand why she changed so when you, after you, when you stopped coming to the house. I couldn't make it out for ever so long. And then suddenly, she spread her hands expressively. It was because you stayed away that she looked so ill and unhappy. Oh, yes, it was, Lynn, she added with soft determination as he tried to speak. There's more than I know, of course, but gradually I seem to be understanding. And now what's breaking her heart doubly is because she thinks you killed Buster. Lynn ran a... Lynn ran a finger round his collar as if he were choking. You exaggerate things, he broke out angrily. I, sheer madness, never speak of it again, for God's sake, Violet, unless you want to drive me mad. She looked up with swimming eyes. Then I suppose it doesn't matter about Pansy. He made a despairing gesture. What can I do? You know I'd give my right hand to help her. What can I do? There was a little silence. Then Violet said quietly, You can tell her the truth, Lynn. He turned round and stared at her, the dull color surging into his haggard face. Tell her the truth, he repeated. Why? What do you mean? She hid her face in her hands, suddenly overcome. I was there, she whispered brokenly. I know what happened. I saw it all. Lynn repeated her words expressionlessly. expressionlessly. You saw it all. Oh, but you couldn't have done. It's impossible. Violet, what are you saying? I'm telling the truth. I was coming across the garden to find Buster, and I saw him run out, out at the gate, and I saw Basil coming. He was driving like a madman, and I saw, she began to sob piteously. Oh, it was, it was cruel, cruel. It was murder, sheer wanton murder. Lynn moistened his white lips. He took Violet's arm in a gentle clasp. But you see, of course, you see that it's all for the best. Leave things as they are, he said hoarsely. She, pansy. She'd finished with me long before th this. It doesn't matter if there's one more black mark against my name. But for Matherson, for Pansy to know that the boy was killed by his father. I want to spare her as much as possible. You see that, too. I know. Besides, even if, even if she knew the truth, what's the good? I can't. I mean, she's married. There's Matherson. Violet broke out fiercely. There ought to be a law that allows women to leave men like Matherson. She hates him. If he were my husband and I loved you, I'd leave him without a second thought. He's not entitled to any consideration. He's a brute. We've all got a right to happiness. I only wish s someone would come along and offer me mine, she added, sobbing. Lynn released her. He looked infinitely sad and weary. I've said all that to I've said all that to myself scores of times, he told her gently. I've tried to believe it, but I can't, any more than you can, Violet. It sounds all right, sometimes, but one has got to go on afterwards, and such things always end badly. They must do. Besides, it's not my idea of love to drag the one you most care for in the mud. You mean you're going to let everyone think that you killed Buster? Violet Violet demanded. He made no answer, and she broke out vehemently. Very well then, if you won't tell the truth. I shall. For God's sake, Violet. She laughed miserably. <laughs> God doesn't seem to have much to do with this, she said pathetically. There's Buster gone and Pansy broken hearted and you? You can't leave me out of the question. 
But I can't, and I'm not going to, she answered obstinately. It's not fair or right. Basil did it, and he ought to suffer. What sort of a coward is he to allow you to take the blame? I did it of my own free will. She looked at him with passionate eyes. Anyone would think you were Basil's friend, trying to protect him, she said bitterly, when all the time you must hate him. I don't hate him. I'm sorry for him. Sorry for him? She echoed scornfully. Is that why you gave him 15,000 pounds, I wonder? It was a chance shot, but it went home. Len turned scarlet. I, I don't know what you're talking about, he broke out rapidly. You do. You know perfectly well, Violet declared. I saw a letter in Mr. Donaldson's office the day I went there. I dare say it was a mean thing to do, but I read it, and I'm glad I did. It was written to you, something about paying 15,000 pounds to Basil. It was a business transaction, some shares. Lynn, you told me you never speculated. I don't, I, oh, for God's sake, stop this useless argument. What has it got to do with the present tragedy, whether I gave Mathers and half a million or five shillings? It's no business of yours anyway, he added with unintentional rudeness. Violet's face quivered. I know, I thought you'd be furious with me, but that only makes me more sure that I'm right. Would you like to know what I think, Lynn? No. She gave a little hysterical laugh. <laughs> Very well. Then you've got to hear. I think Basil has been blackmailing you. Rubbish. Lynn's voice was violent, but unconvincing, and Violet went on ruthlessly. I believe that he found out something, perhaps about you and Pansy. And so she broke off, her eyes searching his face, and there was a long silence. Then she said, in a trembling whisper, So, so it is that. Somehow I knew it was. He broke out angrily. I've admitted nothing. There's nothing to admit. For God's sake, leave things alone. If you care anything for me or, or your sister, you leave things alone. It's because I care for you both that I won't. Pansy ought to know the truth. She's bound to find out someday. And then things will be a thousand times worse than if she, than if she knew now. You will be making more trouble for her if you tell her. Besides... He caught himself up sharply. What is there to tell? A silly story that you've imagined and which you can't substantiate. He laid a hand on her shoulder. My dear, it's a wise plan. My dear, it's a wise plan to let sleeping dogs lie, he said more gently. She shook her head. You're not looking at it from Pansy's point of view. Has she got to be miserable for always? He made a hopeless gesture. I can't say for that. Whatever happens, and telling her what you imagine to be true won't help at all. Matherson has had his lesson. He'll be different now. She laughed scornfully. <laughs> Is that all you know of him? She asked. They walked a few steps down the drive together and back. I must go home now, Violet said. I had to come to make sure. He took her hand. Before you go, Violet, you must promise me not to. He could not go, no. He could not go, no. But she finished the sentence for him. Not to tell Pansy the truth, you mean. Well, I'm sorry, Lynn, but I can't make a promise like that. If I did, I should only break it. Lynn turned very white. It'll, it will be your word against mine, he said hoarsely. She met his angry eyes bravely. They'll believe me, she answered. He made one last appeal. It's for Pansy's sake. I know her better than you do. You don't, or you wouldn't have treated her like this. I suppose you thought it was kind to stop away and avoid us all and let Pans and letting Pansy think... What she does think. It's so like a man. They never seem to understand that when a woman cares, really cares, she can bear anything except being allowed to think a man's grown tired of her. She broke down into bitter weeping. Oh, I hate Basil for what he's done to us. She sobbed. I'll never, never forgive him. And that is the end of chapter 24 of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter, and I hope you return soon for the next one. Have a great day. Bye.